All right, onwards, onwards we go. Uh, we get to now the salamanders. So again, we have our basic uh, amphibian uh, sort of characteristics, cutaneous respiration, uh, that sort of transition from aquatic life to terrestrial life. Uh, we look at the apodin group, the Sicilians. Now we shift over to our uh, caudata group, the tailed uh, amphibians. So again, includes two distinct categories, uh, visually quite distinctive, what we call the salamanders and also the newts, right? Salamanders, a little bit more terrestrial. Newts tend to be a little bit more aquatic throughout their adult life. Uh, we have 10 families represented by almost 700 different species. So it's a, a diverse group. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, they're distributed primarily in the Northern Hemisphere. So if you were to go to the Amazon rainforest, lush, lush, lush uh, tropical forest, you go to the uh, sort of the uh, South uh, Hemisphere areas of, of Africa, you'd be surprised that they're gonna be absent uh, from a lot of these areas. So primarily a northern hemisphere distribution. So biogeographically, uh, they didn't sort of radiate down south, they stayed up kind of more north. Uh, lots of uh, different groups, right? So again, we have our 10 families, and when we start to talk about families, families are gonna be designated with that suffix I-D-A-E, right? So the Ambistomatidae, Amphiumidae, Cryptobranchidae, Hynobiidae, Plethodontiidae, Proteidae, uh, Ryacotrinidae, Salamandridae, and Sirenidae. So when you see the IDAE, you're talking about a taxonomic level. So we have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family. So kingdom animalia, uh, phylum vertebrata, or I should say phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, uh, class uh, amphibia, order caudata or urdella and then these 10 families. So there's variation amongst these almost 700 uh, species, right? So it gives you an idea, 35 of these species, three species, uh, only one species, 50 species, about almost uh, 370 species. So it shows you a little bit of the diversification. So I'll talk about some of these. Uh, again, we don't have time to just dive into each and every group, although there's a lot of uh, variation, a lot of very fascinating members of each of these categories. So uh, when you think of a salamander, most of you are going to think of one of these plethodontid salamanders, and they're the most diverse. Um, they range from very, very little kind of tiny rare things to these very large, uh, almost again, one and a half meter long salamander, so just a lot of diversity in these groups. So just trying to show you these salamanders in their natural environment, right? So if you were to go out and explore, you go hike, you go purposely searching for these amphibians, this is the type of habitat that you will find them in. So we notice there's running water, so you can see evidence of trees and shade up above, the canopy of trees providing a cooler temperature down below, less risk of dehydration, better chance of keeping the skin moist, right? So this is the habitat for these, um, these salamanders primarily. So again, pretty environment there, pretty little mountain, little stream, and we have then our salamanders. So um, up in Oregon, there was a lot of cool places to search for these. A lot of habitats look like that. So they're, um, again, a neat diversity of, of uh, amphibians of salamanders called Dayton's up there. You know, Paso, not so much. So again, different examples, different uh, habitats, and showing you that uh, sort of that organism in its natural habitat scenario there. So yeah, so if you're ever in these types of habitats and you want to see these for, for, you know, in life, for yourself, in person there, uh, that's what you'll do. You can kind of move some of these uh, logs. Sometimes they hide under the logs or carefully move some of the rocks. They'll be under there. Be careful not to crush them. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're, they're fun to, to work with. Uh, we're going to get into coloration later, but you can see this is not trying to camouflage. Right? So this is basically what we call aposomatic coloration. I'll get into that more later again, but 
uh, some of these are toxic and they're going to be able to defend themselves with, uh, with some, some pretty ugly alkaloids and other chemicals. Uh, so again, not trying to camouflage, but trying to advertise their presence there. So again, uh, not as pristine, not as pretty of a, of a habitat, but again, these are able to survive in these areas there. A much more higher elevation species up in the you know high mountains, cold. Uh, if we go up to Rio Doso, Cloudcroft, it's snowy, cold, and you'll be surprised. There's a uh, there's an endemic form, a, a kind of rare. It's not rare in that area, but it doesn't exist in many other parts of the world. So we call that endemic. And again, you can find these salamanders up in these high, cold mountain area mountain areas there. So again, just a little bit of their biology. We get into the idea of how do they continue to reproduce? How, do, how have these uh, salamanders been able to continue their, their place here in, in the world? They got to reproduce, right? And they reproduce a different way than the Sicilians, than, the, than those legless apodents, right? So the legless apodents had that phallodium, that little reproductive organ for internal fertilization not the caudatans, not the salamanders, right? They have external fertilization, uh, these hynobidae and cryptobranchidae. Um, they are going to kind of have this external fertilization where the females release the eggs out into the water and males release sperm, kind of like fish, you know, the external fertilization. Another set of these families, will have internal fertilization, but not the same way as the apodons. They don't have that phyllodium again. What they will do is kind of weird, I guess kind of strange. Uh, they are going to release what we call a spermatophore. So a spermatophore, it's a little package of sperm. Right? So this little packet of sperm. So the male and female engage in their little rituals. The, the male impresses the female. The female decides, yeah, okay, I guess I'll give this guy a chance, whatever. So the male then will find a, a smooth area, a, a, a log, a, a leaf, uh, just something on, on the ground, and they deposit their little spermatophore, right? So there's a finger for size reference. There's a spermatophore. All the sperm is in that little packet. And these little spermatophores, you'll find these sort of scattered all in that environment there, right? So the, the males just deposit the sperm, deposit sperm, deposit sperm, deposit sperm, and guide the female, the female consents, and then she will go and literally uptake that little spermatophore with her cloaca. So we get into a really interesting discussion on sort of selection, right? So if you're a male, you want to assist, you want to guide the female over to your spermatophore, right? Uh, in some cases, it's just a matter of, you know what, I'm, I don't know, I'm just gonna drop spermatophores, bloop, 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 and hopefully uh, some lonely female arrives and, and uptakes them. So it can be survival of the fittest. If a female, she doesn't know exactly, is this spermatophore, is this spermatophore from a real healthy individual or from a little weakling individual? So. Uh, it's amazing how evolutionarily this has persisted as, as we go on throughout the history of these uh, organisms. Yeah. So spermatophores. So a lot of the species can be identified. If you, if you know these enough, you can find the spermatophores and know what species they came from. So each spermatophore is sort of unique to the different families, the different species. Again, there's a top view, there's a side view. So they're the uh, the spermatophore has been laid, and again, the male trying to guide the female to uptake his spermatophore there. Interesting stuff. Huh? I mean, it'd be strange if humans worked this way, though, right? But it works for the salamanders, maybe not for us. So there's a lot of mating rituals. There's a lot of uh, sort of pre-mating behaviors that, that these uh, salamanders undergo, these newts. So Again, trying to stimulate the female, uh, trying to coax the female to the spermatophore, uh, trying to, again, enhance the, the chance that the female will, will uptake the spermatophore. There's aggressive behaviors. There's a lot of 
uh, dancing behavior. It's just some, some neat stuff. I'll see if I can find some videos that, that really illustrate this here. Uh, newts take it to a different level. Um, newts are crazy. The males get all, oh, they change their body. They try to look like little miniature Godzillas sometimes. So yeah, that's the same species that the male develops these just branches and these little fins and uh, they get all crazy, right? They go all out, they're trying to impress the female. Um, so just, just interesting stuff there. Uh, <clears throat> so I've been talking primarily on salamanders. Uh, newts do a lot of the same things, uh, except newts are gonna spend most of their time sort of in the water. Uh, they lay their eggs, the eggs develop in the water, um, and they just, again, they have a very different feature. They look different as adults compared to uh, the, the embryos there. Uh, so since we're talking about weird sort of spermatogenesis, uh, not spermatogenesis, so spermatophores, and we're talking about uh, different uh, reproductive aspects, I want to bring this up. We call this kleptogenesis. So kleptogenesis is unique to one particular species, and we call this Ambystema jeffersonium, uh, jeffersonianium, right? So all of these species are, or all of these individuals, all of this species here is female. So 100% female. So no purpose for males. Males of this species are not, they're not existent, right? So ladies, you might be really happy with this, or maybe you'll be sad, I don't know, but for guys, this is evidence that males are not required, right? But uh, we have a all female species that must be fertilized by a male from a different bisexual species. So this gets strange, right? Uh, klepto means to, uh, like a kleptomaniac, somebody that steals, steals, steals stuff, right? So kleptogenesis reproducing by stealing uh, another male, stealing sperm from another male from another species. And, and again, this is weird. It would be like, like humans, let's say humans, um, only females existed in the human race, no males, but there's male chimpanzees, there's male orangutans, there's male gorillas, there's male um, baboons, whatever. Right? And then the females, would then sort of select, eh, I'm gonna get sperm from the orangutan. No, I'm gonna get sperm from the baboon. I'm gonna get sperm from the chimpanzee. It's strange, 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 strange stuff. Yeah? But that's what happens, right? So up to five different species can be sperm donors. So basically, uh, you can start to see what kind of complex genome starts to develop, right? So you have maybe one mating event from from this baby daddy and another made an event from this baby daddy. So you have offspring that are then mixed up genetically from multiple species, right? And then when those, they're all female, right? When, when those females are born, uh, again, then they're genetically different and they go off and, and reproduce again. So it, it's, it's just, the DNA is just crazy, right? It's enormously complex genome. But evidence that, uh, yeah, that this plasticity, this kind of almost breaks the rule of our, uh, if you think back, our biological species concept that we need a male and female to reproduce fertile offspring. Well, this really breaks that rule because there's no males of this particular species, right? So, um, again, every offspring that they produce is a female, which theoretically then would be. Uh, fertile, that she could have offspring if she finds a male from a different species. So again, weird, weird, weird stuff. Kleptogenesis. I'll let you read up more about it in the book if you want there. Another thing that's very strange is the idea of pedomorphosis, right? Pedomorphosis. So um, we, we know that amphibians start out as little tadpoles, right? And then over time, they then decide, you know what, I'm gonna go out and be become a frog, right? So, well, there's variations to that. So if the environment is so stable that there's no reason for them to metamorphose, there's enough food in their environment, you know what, I'm gonna stay uh, as this juvenile form. Imagine humans, right? Humans that have, uh, if you were a millionaire, would you have the, 
in the sense, if you were born a millionaire, would you have the same work, work ethic that you have now? I don't know. I think if you were born a millionaire, there's no reason to get up in the morning. I'm, I'm rich. I'm ready a millionaire. Why do I got to go to work, right? So if you are already in an environment, if you're well adapted to that environment and there's no reason to change from that environment, uh, a lot of these organisms reach maturity. They, they reach sexual maturity in their larval form. So this is a larval form of a salamander. They have the gills. You can see the gills. Uh, they have the gills, axolotls, axolotl, they call these. So they have the gills. They're breathing in water. They haven't metamorphosed out to the adult phase, but they've reached sexual maturity, and they can breed. So they're like, think of like big immature babies. They look like immature babies, but they're sexually mature, and they can fertilize, right? So they reach sexual maturity in their larval form. And why does this happen? Well, some species fail to produce the hormones associated with metamorphosis. So there's, there's a, um, decreased thyroid hormones. Uh, there's a, just, there hasn't been enough stress hormones as the pond is drying that, that makes them transition. And, and some species uh, are going to be uh, pretty branky. So they, they never, they never change their body form. 100% of their life, they stay aquatic in the water. So it, it's just this uh, strange behavior in some of these organisms. So let me go back. This is the same organism as this. This is what we call the tiger salamander because it kind of looks like a tiger. I think they got a real neat little face. They always look happy. Um, so this is the same organism as this. When they're larval, they call them again axolotl, axolotls. Right? Axolotls are, are these. They look like these you know, furry, fringy gills there. So if there's no necessity, if the pond stays wet, if it never dries, if there's enough food, uh, these tiger salamanders will stay in this uh, sort of idea as, uh, pedomorphs, they, they don't transition into adulthood, they don't transition into the adult body form. Uh, so again, remain pedomorphic unless environmental conditions trigger metamorphosis into the adult form. Now we can artificially induce this, right? If, uh, if we use these thyroid hormones, tyroxine T4, uh, it transitions their change and they, they lose the gills, they move on to land, right? Um, if they're deficient in that, if the pituitary gland isn't uh, completely active, they don't have that signal, then they stay in that pedomorphic form. So interesting, just interesting biology. And these things are amazing. These tiger salamanders live here in El Paso. They are around. They're not very common here, but uh, it, it amazes me that you can find these salamanders in these harsh desert environments. So again, there's that pedomorphic form. You can see it's crawling in some rocks there. It would be aquatic, it would be underwater. Um, if these ponds or lakes start to dry, they get the proper pituitary signals, T4, whatever stimulates in their body, uh, then they start to morphose out. So this is again how you would find these in the El Paso area. Um, I haven't seen them too much close to here. The closest I've seen them is up near Las Cruces and some of these cattle tanks, these big cattle, these cow ponds. It's nasty water and, and these things will, will, will survive in there. And they'll, they'll be larval until that pond dries up, they go underground, it rains again, and then they come up as these uh, sort of adult formed. But it's interesting, interesting salamanders. So again, just showing you some of the pedomorphic forms. So we call these uh, mud puppies or water dogs. They, their whole life, they will stay pedomorphic. Uh, the sirens with only two legs, but they don't have the back legs. Uh, amphumas that have the four legs. Um, so again, a lot of variation. These cave salamanders are very strange as well. Pedomorphic forms. Uh, just lots of neat diversity with salamanders. Um, so pedomorphosis has an impact not just on, on gills, but also on bone density. Uh, it enables in that transition, more ossification on the bones. So lots of neat changes in their bodies when they transition from the larval aquatic form to the terrestrial adult form. 
ah, oh, these, these are cool, right? The crypto branchids, these are big, these are big, big, big salamanders, right? So there's two species, two, three, basically two species that are living now. One, one's not doing too great, but uh, here in the United States, we have what we call the hellbender, cryptobranchus, right? It's, uh, we find these around Alabama, uh, the Allegheny River, those types of areas. And if we move over to Japan, they have Andreas, uh, one or two species of Andreas over there. And again, these things are big, right? These are one and a half meters long, right? Imagine this hundred year old, uh, foot and a half meter long type of organism. They're, they're big and, and heavy and just strange, very primitive uh, organisms. Right? So they're um, just living, to me, in my mind, they're like living Devonian uh, archaic forms of organisms. Imagine these first amphibians that, that transitioned. I think they would look something like this. Yeah. So you can see they're predatory, right? Eating some sort of water snake there, a banded water snake looks like. Um, we have just, just strange, strange hellbenders, uh, Andreas, these large cryptobranchid salamanders, right? Remember IDAE? So this is the family of salamanders, cryptobranchidae. This doesn't have very many species, but uh, very unique forms that it does have. All right, so I'm going to stop it there, and then we'll transition over to the to the frogs next.